The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight's guest is the councilman in the city's 11th council district. That includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Bedford Park, Kingsbridge, Riverdale, Norwood, Ben Cortland Village, Wakefield, and Woodlawn. He'll tell me if I missed any. We have a number of items to chat about with him, including budgeting, parks development, a variety of land use issues, early childhood education, and even some questions about politics and his own future. Please join me in welcoming the councilman from the 11th district in the Bronx, Councilmember Andrew Cohn. Nice to have you with us, sir. Great to be here, Gary. It's nice to have you back. Um, let's start, um, I guess, where things start and sometimes end, and that is with budgeting. And you have been a fan of participatory budgeting from, I guess, the minute it was introduced. Um, and, and there are a number of issues that have, you know, I think, arisen out of it that I'm assuming constituents are happy about. Are there issues that you kind of didn't think about and that constituents brought up and you said, well, you're right and I'll help you get it done? Oh, de definitely. The, the reason that uh, I think that uh, PB is good is the idea generation. I, I get ideas from people who, you know, you're a lifelong Bronxite, you know your block better than I could ever know at your corner. And those ideas have been very, very helpful. I mean, there are challenges with PB. Uh, you know, we've had trouble getting more people vote than I, than I would like. Sometimes, you know, some of the well, challenges. too few people. Not enough people involved. vote. Yeah. Um, and even though we've expanded, we can vote online now. Um, and also one of the challenges is, I try to be careful with this, some years we do better jobs than others. I don't want PB to be divisive. So I don't want people in Van Cortland Village to say that, oh, people in Norwood are getting everything because they outvoted us. Or, so trying mm. to not pit neighborhoods against each other has also been a challenge. That means you have to be an arbiter in the, in the, in the long, long run. Um, I, I just have a short list here. Bus countdown clocks. These were. This was something that uh, came out of that. Yeah, and uh, you know it's funny. Even though there's apps and stuff like that, people really like it. It uh, gets requested every year, and it just you know with the challenges as you know, but we're so dependent on bus service in the Northwest Bronx, uh, having that security that you know a bus is coming, you know it's when it's going to be here. Uh, people find that to be very helpful. And, and, you know, there are simple things that all politics is local. Certainly for a council member, that would be the case. Uh, potholes and things like that. You say, gee, I had no idea. I mean, you can't be on every street. And so uh, overall, um, you think it works. Is there a way to reform it to make it better? Or is We're really giving it a comprehensive review this year because I, I think trying to keep it fresh, trying to, again, that idea generation that was so valuable to me in the beginning, so we're working. Now, uh, uh, I see. The ideas are there, but you still... Uh, sounds to me like the outreach uh, needs to be better. I think um, when I hear it and when people hear it, it's like, well, that's nice, but it's, you know, does it really work? Do I really have the time? You know, that kind of thing. And let people feel, uh, you know... Maybe there's a way to streamline it such that, uh, that we could get the idea generation, which I think is the most valuable part, and really trying to get the word out uh, so that people have a uh, say. Those two pieces, I think. I, I guess along that philosophy of how to go about governing, um, the, the uh, MTA did the bus route redesign. That, at least in theory, was you know, community by community. You tell us what you think, and we'll do that because we don't know everything about uh, the redesign. Uh, what's your thought about what they came out with? Uh, are you happy with it? Do you think your constituents were taken care of? You know, it's interesting. Um I have not been, you know, there are a wide array of MTA problems that face my district and face this city. And ultimately, you know, the city does not have a tremendous amount of control over the MTA. We, you know, the state controls the MTA, 
think people know that the governor controls the FDA. Um, but we, Though he might protest on occasion. The, but we do have <laughs> some say it, with buses in terms of, you know, we control the streets. Mm -hmm. So there is some leverage over, over buses and bus service. Uh, again, I think our issues are really the, the amount of service. Um, but a lot of times to try to improve, like bus bunching is the problem where, you know, you'll be waiting for a bus, no bus, no bus, and then two or three of the same bus will show up. That's called bus, bus bunching for you. <laughs> I, I never all. heard it, uh, exactly. a, a name for it, but <laughs> we that, all know what yes. it is. Um, <clears throat> so, but that involves, in order to avoid that happening, or one of the things that could help mitigate that, for instance, is streamlining the bus route. Less turns. Straight lines work better than than a lot of turns. Right. But every time you change a route, there's winners and losers. Somebody's gonna have to walk farther to a bus stop than they do now. Right. One of the things I, I, that they did do was eliminate some stops, yeah. and so that will move the buses quicker. Uh, maybe it did eliminate some turns, but of course, what you just said is true, that somebody's gonna have to uh, take an extra walk. One thing, and now you know, I thought of it just the other day, and I, I in a way regret that I never brought it up. Those articulated buses, the double buses, I can't tell you how many times I see big empty buses rolling through our streets. Maybe they should say, well, certain hours we have single buses and other hours during rush hour when they're busiest. But, you know, you go in the middle of the night and these things like sound like tanker, you know, trucks, uh, trailer trucks going through a, a, a street in the Bronx. It's frustrating. My, my grandfather used to have an expression, figures oh, lie go. and liars figure. So MTA will tell you that there's more capacity on the line by using the articulated bus, you know, it doesn't really provide any more service. If you weren't there when that bus came by, you don't care if it was an articulated bus or a regular bus. There, there is a lot of talk um, in your district um, about um, traffic. Uh, DOT has come by and has walked uh, the district uh, once or twice. Um, there are red lights all over the place that tend to stop traffic. Um, how do you feel the DOT has done? I mean, they, they, they remodeled Broadway. Do you have a, a feeling on, on how that has gone and how that's going? I think Broadway has been, by and large, been successful. I think the proof is in the pudding in terms of the stats, on it, which are still, they're still studying it. But I think it has slowed it down. And honestly, that was the goal of the plan, was to not have Broadway be as fast as it was, that it's, you know, I have tons of people, children, trying to get to Van Cortland Park and across Broadway. Uh, and there were very long runs that were uncontrolled. And there was a lot of truck traffic. It was an alternate to try to get to the Major Deegan. It still is. But I think that this has been successful in making it safer. And that mm -hmm. was really the goal of the plan. Uh, although I wish that all of these, what they call road diet plans, would incorporate kind of how people live. There's no, if you pick somebody up, for example, and I've done it at the 242nd Street station on Broadway, there's no place to pull over and pick them up. Now, I realize it may be not totally legal, but because they're lanes, you got to keep going, and whoever it is has probably got to meet you somewhere down Broadway, and it's still not legal because there's not enough room to pull over. I had wished that they had reformatted it that way. That's what I think. Not a bad idea? Uh, I will say that, they're, that trying to meet the balance of all the users on the street is a challenge. The cars the pedestrians, the cyclists. It's really, there's a finite amount of space and everybody's competing to use that space. Uh, Norwood News had a story um, and you were pretty vocal about your upsetness over the uh, skate park in um, uh, Williamsburg that seems to be taking a long time. And, and so we can talk about that issue. But then the larger issue of the Parks Department being able to do renovations and get things done. So let's talk about that park and then we can talk about maybe a larger issue. I was really, you know, one of the, when I first got elected, uh, a group of young kids came to see me in my office. They brought me a uh, skateboard, uh, <laughs> and they said that they really need a skate, par uh, skate park in the Williamsburg Oval, and I thought it was a great idea. I was able to get the resources to get How it done. How much money was it? Uh, about a million dollars, maybe a little less than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it took a long time, but work finally got started. Work appeared to be just about done. I thought we were going to have a... Uh, uh, a ribbon cutting uh, in the spring, uh, and there seemed to be some construction defect now that is uh, that's going to cause them to have to do some repours to try to make it uh, work the way it's supposed to work. So, you know, you, you suggested certainly in the article that there are problems with the Parks Department getting things done. What, what, 
what are those problems? And I, I'm going to make a suggestion, and you can agree or disagree. The, the problems are myriad, but there's an example I like to give. Okay. And this is just as in terms of delays. When the Parks Department doesn't actually build the project, they hire a contractor, and there's a contract. That contract is reviewed by the lawyers for the Parks Department. That seems to make sense. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Contracts. Which also um, would make sense, no? I guess. Well, just here, let's uh, keep on. Yeah. How, how about the Law Department? Oh. Uh, and then the lawyers for the controller's office. All so, four city lawyers, all on, in theory on the same side of the equation, and each one has a designated amount of time, and they don't happen simultaneously. I do my review, then I pass it to you, you do. So it's months and months and months, you know, 60 days each of contract review just before anything happens. Is, is the Parks it's, Department the only uh, agency that has that? I no, mean, it's, it is a citywide problem. Uh, I hope uh, that you know the mayor was in Albany the other day, uh, and I hope that our state legislators will grant the city some significant design build authority um, that really could make a difference in getting some of these projects done. Wait, are you saying create another uh, authority? No, that the, no, no, that there is <laughs> legislative. The although I have had some thoughts about that too, that could be helpful. For instance, you know, the school construction authority seems to be doing a very good job of building schools, and that is an authority. Uh, but design well, that took years to get to that point. It, it has, but it, it's working now. But design build just really frees the city up from some red tape uh, and some of the bureaucracy uh, to try to get these projects done. I faster. was going to uh, say that it's been an ongoing dialogue about lack of budget for the Parks Department, that where there are others, use the DEP, for example, they seem to be able to, I don't want to say print money, but when they want a project, they can make it happen for a lot of money. Uh, you, you certainly know what uh, I, we're thinking about as a regard yeah, to but the it's not it's plan. for not for the love of money. I mean, you know, the project <laughs> this, the skate park was for instance was fully funded. It's not So a, it wasn't a matter of money. Yeah, it's not a Interesting. question. Yeah. Um do, are you concerned about the level of parks funding? Is that frustrating to you? Yes. Uh in terms of maintenance. I knew if I kept yes, at it I would yes, get that. Yes, in terms of maintenance. Maintenance is really uh, an issue. Uh you know, last summer we had a lot of frustration. We the parks department had a tough time getting the lawn mode last year. Um, they seem to be doing a better job so far this year. We really, I work closely. We have a great borough commissioner, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa, and we sat down early in the spring or maybe even at the end of the winter. I was like, we cannot, you know, you have to be able to mow the lawn this year. I'm not going to field these kinds of complaints. And so far they've really been doing it. But maintenance is an ongoing issue. There's not enough gardeners. There's not enough uh, people taking care of our parks. And, um, uh, you know, she sits down with you. You can be sure, that I don't know how many council members we have in the Bronx, but each one has probably got a very similar uh, dialogue with or at least hopes to have it. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, something that came up a little while ago, and that was the notion of putting a, a treatment facility. Uh, actually, I guess it was Conway was the store yeah. on, on Broadway. Um, it, it appears that the, the, the um, a developer is pulled out of that plan. But in theory, um, is that a good spot? W would, could that have been a good spot? I mean, how do you view the whole notion? Uh, I had a lot of reservations about that spot, which I communicated to the state, which had to issue a license. Um, and I am in incredibly sympathetic to the plight that, you know, we have an opioid crisis. I represent part of the 5-2 precinct. The 5-2 precinct is uh, really the number one uh, precinct, unfortunately, in opioid deaths. So it's, I'm aware of the problem that I take it seriously. But for in, you, I'm sure you've had a lot of guests who tell you about what's going on in the South Bronx, in the hub you know, community. The, the street's covered with needles. With, and so we don't have that in Kingsbridge. And I would, was very concerned about bringing this facility in and bringing users into the community and the impact that could have. So I'm, I was not convinced that this was a great site for that. And this is the obvious follow-up question. So, given the fact that you uh, agree that there's a problem, then where is a good site? You put it in a quiet, or, I mean, obviously that it was a central thoroughfare, and I think we understand that. But you put it in a quiet neighborhood, they're going to say, wait a minute, this used to be a quiet neighborhood. Now this is coming. Well, again, up. Community Board 8 in the 50th Precinct, I don't think have this, uh, the same level of problem, of crisis that are going on in other parts of the Bronx, including, in my own, again, in my own district. There might be places where I think you know, even though, uh, like I said, the 5-2 I mean, precinct... people in Norwood will, <laughs> will say, wait a minute, you're, gonna, you're talking about us. Well, 
I'm proud to say, in, even in the 5-2 precinct, you know, they divide it into sectors. The sector that I represent happens to be the safest uh, portion. Well, congratulations. <laughs> the uh, but, the, but there are communities where I think it's indisputable that these services are needed. And it's not clear to me that this level of service was needed in Kingsbridge. Okay. And, 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 and the risk, I think, was not And worth how much the, does the profile of the uh, provider come in there? Because there were some questions about saying, well, it, you know, in the past, can, has this provider done a good job of, quote unquote, policing it or at least securing it, uh, you know, making sure that it's clean without needles uh, around the area? This was a new venture. Yeah. Uh, it was untested. Uh, and again, I just, you can't, I don't want to experiment and say, well, maybe this will work, maybe it's not. Once the genie's out of the bottle, uh, and again, you don't see people, uh, you know, I, I don't see any evidence of needles on Broadway. I don't see people nodding out on Broadway, and I'm not prepared, even though, again, I think that the services are needed. I don't think they're needed on Broadway, and I'm not, I thought that the risk was too great. Uh, Norwood News talked about, uh, had a story about how um, uh, con uh, construction is really happening in that part of the Bronx. Are you satisfied that the construction is helpful? And, uh, not, uh, and listen, all construction it, you know, is, it gets in the way, but uh, do you think that these are good developments? Uh, Marshall Lee Grand, uh, they listed the East 204th Street by Villa Avenue, um, and et cetera, et cetera. By and large, I have found a way to be supportive of affordable housing development, particularly in Norwood and Bedford Park. I think that both of those communities are really ripe for the forces of gentrification, and I want to make sure that people who live there now can continue to afford to live there. And these affordable housing developments will be affordable in you know perpetuity for 40 you're, you're, years. You're convinced that they are going to be, because the question is affordable for who, you're convinced that, that this is good, I'm using that word, good development. I know that you know, affordable for who is an issue, and right now a lot of the affordable housing is comparable to market rate today. But I, I try to look for the, in the long run, these apartments, again, are going to stay affordable for 40 years. As market forces drive rents up in Norwood and Bedford Park, these apartments are going to stay affordable. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that will be an anchor uh, so that we have a balanced neighborhood, that people who've lived here for their whole lives can still find an affordable place to live. I, you know, and I, I go to Brooklyn periodically, and I see what I think has been uncontrollable development and that has really displaced you know, a lot of people and, and radically changed the community, whereas I'm hoping things happen here in a more gradual and inclusive is way. Is it tough to draw, hold the line when there is this move in the Bronx to develop, develop, develop? I, I got to give credit where credit is due. I think HPD has done a good job of working with affordable housing developers in the district that we've come up mostly with reasonable projects. You know, I mean, and... You get involved? And, and you think other council members have the opportunity? Because a lot of times people feel like, you know, they do end arounds. Uh, I work closely with HPD. I'm not shy about calling them and telling them I think <coughs> this is a problem. There's, an, you know, a development in CB7 right now that is people can't get on the same page with. And HPD has been very supportive of the community board uh, and my office in trying to bring people together, like, right. you know, project's too high, it's too this, it's too that, um, to try to get on the same page. But we have a development that we think makes sense. Uh, there's been a, um, a pretty rich dialogue in the Riverdale Press uh, over, over, I mean, we can go back and forth, uh, uh, a letter that you wrote and then their responsive editorial. Um, so let's start um, with this whole idea of special natural resources districts. And the, I guess the idea City Planning Commission wants to convert them to a special natural area district. Talk about that and let's get in, uh, at least some idea about what has gone on here. In the city of New York, there's a large, what they call special natural area district, the SNAD, in Staten Island. And we have a. I really didn't want to use that term. The SNAD. It, the SNAD. But it is what it is. And we have a small, <laughs> relatively small piece here in, in the Northwest Bronx. Uh, City Planning Commission has proposed making some changes. Uh, I think uh, in the community board, uh, to their credit, they, have a, they had a working group on this, and they did a very, very thoughtful analysis. And the plan contains some things that I think people sort of universally agree are very good more modern environmental regulations, just sort of updating these regulations that are from and, the 1970s. And can I interject? It's so that people who have homes that they want to upgrade or develop in their, on their own, uh, they have been uh, not been able to do that because of the, this red tape that it takes to do it. So it, 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 treats, it treats, uh, in, in even it does, uh, the new proposal treats large lots and institutions like the Hebrew Home or uh, uh, Chervier, like these large lots uh, are getting much more rigorous oversight, 
and they're trying to loosen some of the oversight on individual homeowners who want to add a deck or expand their deck or bump out their kitchen so that they can do it without having to go uh, to the community board. But there are a lot of issues. That I don't think that this will, the community board hasn't actually had a chance to weigh in. They had a meeting, uh, the uh, hearing the other day, but uh, there was not a quorum. Well, are you in favor of the, the, um, uh, you know, the new adjustments to the regulations? Do you think that's going, the it at is least the dialogue going in the right direction? Uh, I, city planning has definitely indicated that they're willing to negotiate, but this is not soup yet. This proposal is not acceptable in its current format. There need to be some changes. One of the, the primary thing is the Department of Buildings is going to approve, right now, what the city planning is suggesting that DOV approve uh, site plans or for the homeowners. That's not acceptable. Someone from city planning needs to be able to say that we, they've looked at these plans and they're in compliance with the more, law. more to come. So yes. then there was this whole dialogue uh, between you and the land use chair, Charles Merdler. You came out, uh, frankly, surprising. I've known you a long time, and you came out very directly and said that he is part of the problem. And then the Riverdale Press came out and said, well, wait a minute, who are you to say? So I, I, you want to shed some light on um, what you think and what the issues are? Is there anything that you know needs to be addressed? I mean, I, as you point out, I covered it pretty explicitly. It's public <laughs> knowledge. I explicitly didn't, I didn't. In, the, in the paper. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not taking issue particularly with what the Riverdale Press said, but I think that if a power is not being exercised in an appropriate way by an individual, that might be an opportunity to review whether or not that power should stay with the entity that has it. That right. was really my point. So that, that was your point, and it was interesting that you made it public. Of course, they said that, well, you know, we editorialized about uh, uh, the community board chair, and then you and the assemblyman came out. A any, any comments about it, or you let it lie? Or? Yeah, I think it's a little bit much ado about a little inside baseball much ado about nothing. Uh, uh, the other thing that's out there in, in print and in various places, and people say, well, uh, Andy Cohen is thinking about his future. You're term limited out. Um, I am term and, limited. And um, so uh, there's also talk, well, you know what, he wants to be a judge, or maybe he'll, I don't want to make any suggestion that's out there. So wh what are your thoughts on what's coming up in the future? I appreciate you asking, because I just want to make one point clear. Ah, I uh, love are my the cameras rolling? Are the cameras rolling. <laughs> I love my job. I, but I'm term limited. My job is going to come to an end, no matter how much I love it. If I could stay, if I could run again, I would definitely run again. I feel like, you know, I may be the only person who thinks this, I don't know, but I think I've done a good job. Uh, and it is very satisfying work. But the nature of term limits, and again, the voters voted for term limits, uh, so is that ultimately I'm going to be looking to do something else at some point in the future, mm -hmm. or a, a definite point in the future. So, so uh, I, I mean, are you aggressively saying, well, you know what, there's going to be judicial conventions, make sure my name is in there, or, I mean... I was a law secretary in Bronx Supreme Court for eight years. I loved working at the courthouse, um, uh, but I'm kind of got all options on the table. And okay. So if somebody has a good idea, participatory. <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, the the borough president is term limited too. I, I, I haven't, you know, I'm considering that also. I'm, right. There's any number of options yeah. out there. One one other issue I do want to talk to you about, and we did it on uh, this uh, program, and that was the whole range of um, uh, issues with early childhood education. And I know you have personally gotten involved in supporting a lot of the. Uh, independent um, uh, early childhood centers and amalgamated in Marble Hill and, and in your district. You know them which ones better than I do. Um, now the new RFP is out there on how early childhood education is going to be delivered in the city of New York in the future. Uh, we did a show on it and uh, there was a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with what the city is proposing. Uh, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? All right, well, first, just taking a step back, when, uh, when you know, UPK has been amazing and transformative. However, uh, when, when they rolled it out in the 11th Council District, I got zero seats in existing schools. Zero, none. So that meant that community-based organizations had to step up to the plate to provide all of the UPK seats we got in the Northwest Bronx. I don't think that the DOE has treated those uh, service providers fairly. I think they've been very harsh with them, and I think that they've left them out on a limb. I will say that we have made a lot of progress. In sh the RFP got pulled back. It did get pulled back. Um, it did back. get pulled no, back. Because they um, watched Bronx talk. Yes. They saw those advocates. Uh, and a lot of concessions have been made to make that RFP better. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue really of pay parity uh, is not resolved and needs to be resolved. Hopefully it will be resolved in the budget or shortly thereafter. 
Um, but for instance, at the Amalgamated Nursery School and Ampark right across the street, they both provide UPK. The teachers at, at Ampark, at Amalgamated, are making less than the teachers at uh, Ampark, and that's... For doing the same job. Exactly the same job. So uh, just to uh, go back to what you originally said for clarity for uh, the viewers, so what happened was, in your district, uh, there, when they established UPK, um, there were no seats available through that, so kids all need a place to go. The independents stood up. Then the city developed UPK centers, and all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, those independents are getting hurt because the students are leaving their programs and going to UPK. What, exactly. What's the resolve on that? Uh, like, uh, well, I, I one, mean, three, you know, they, they <coughs> exist. And 3K is coming so there, that there will be you know, a greater need for capacity again, and I think, but I, you know, I think that the CBOs are really going to be you know, once bitten, twice shy in terms of how they're mm -hmm. going to meet, meet this need. Mm -hmm. And w give, give us some uh, inside baseball on how the parity issue gets resolved. You say they withdrew the RFP. Does that come down to some people in a room saying, all right, we heard them, let's do it? Or is it you and maybe others on an education committee sit down with um, uh, you know, the DOE and say, okay, and have a negotiation session? I think it would be very interesting for people to see how these things come about. Well, I, the city council heard the service providers just, you know, I mean, you know firsthand that they have been shy about reaching out to my office. And I carry that message to City Hall, but the service providers also come directly to the steps of City Hall. Uh, and I think that also in response to the RFP, that they that the DOE learn, you know, heard the providers loud and clear, that there was really a problem. Uh, and uh, I think that it is, you know, people working together. I think it is collectively going to get addressed. Uh, but we got about thirty seconds. What's next? What, like, like either, you know, tomorrow. What, what, what what's the thing that's there, there's on your a, pay, mind? a second pay parity issue that I've been working closely on uh, in terms. You know, God forbid you ever find yourself in a, in a criminal courtroom, you could have an ADA and a legal aid attorney. For reasons I can't explain, the assistant ADA in Bronx County is making in the low 60s, and the legal aid attorney, the uh, same experience is making in the upper 50s. And I really feel like in all these criminal justice They should be reform, doing the same thing. It's the same work. Uh, council member, an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And uh, maybe uh, when you come up with some idea of what you're going to do, you'll come back and we'll talk about it on Bronx. You'll be the first to know. Ah, that would be nice. Thank you so much. Folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, then send us an email at bronxtalk at bronxnet. Dot org. You send a tweet at Bronx Talk. You can post them on our Facebook page. If you have something for the council member, you can, ca you can contact him directly or go through me, whatever you'd like. Uh, we thank our producers, Helen Greenberg, the directors are William Guzman and Nick Marrero. We will see you next week.